If we can relate, like, and relate to like 19th century, that'd be that'd be cool. I'll come. You know, I'm gonna get the regular project, so think about it a little bit and come up with like kind of like a proposal about it. So, all right. All right. Let's take a note down. And so you're gonna do a parade. Who else is thinking about doing a float? We got over there. What's your float? Boxing and tennis. Yeah. And you're. Off parrot? Yeah. It got a cool off parrot. Have a parrot on there. Yeah. Just you're gonna be there. All right, sounds good. And first marriage in the cathedral. Did, he, <laughs> did they make it? No. Did marriage work? No. Well, probably when that happened, they had no choice. All right. So just to review, families before the Industrial Revolution. Families before the Industrial Revolution. Right, we check your notes. Go back to families before the Industrial Revolution. Where did they get most of their um, things to survive? Where did they have to get them? They all made. They had to do it. They had to do it. And pay was based upon what? You know, or how hard you work or your skill level. And who is in charge of you? You. Yeah, me personally. No, you're relatively independent. <laughs> and what was the system of cottage industry? What did they call it back then? When merchants would send out orders? Putting out. Yeah. Putting out. Yeah. Putting out. <laughs> After the Industrial Revolution, it's not going to be like, like one day all of a sudden everything changes. But this is our world today. People are no longer self-sufficient. They're no longer independent. What are they? Where do they get their products? Yeah, other people, they're dependent, they're consumers, they have to buy it. And what's pay based upon? Supply and demand in the wage system. What does skill matter for wage, by the way? It doesn't matter unless that skill's in demand. So, it's important to understand that. It's a totally different idea. And it's, I'm a demoralizing. Let me ask you one more thing. The person who owns all the machines, oh, what's the name for machines? Capital. Okay. Capital. They're, they take the risk, they get the profit. If profits go up, what happens to wages? It has no effect. Profits have no effect. So if you work harder and the profits go up, but there's a lot of unemployed workers, your wages might actually go down. Even a profit is going up for the company itself. It's gonna be really hard to convince workers to do this. Really hard. What's one way they teach young people to be good little workers? Schools and schools. We are taught from day one and it's not necessarily a bad thing. Well, I told you, what's the bad thing about it? If what? Yeah, you don't know. Some of you probably knew, but it's geared up to make you an obedient worker for somebody else. And, and if you would have sat through the meetings I have to sit through for on Mondays, it's even, it's getting worse. All they're talking about is the skills you're gonna come out with to be good workers. And the meetings are getting worse too. So. But, and we went through all the power loom. Oh, what do you call it all? It was with, what industry was the first one to be industrialized? With power loom, what do we call that industry? Textile. What do you call production under one roof now? The factory system. Did I tell you where that term came from? I don't think I did. So now everyone's looking at me like, what? So when the first European traders got to India, where the, what the Indians call places where they would put all the supplies waiting for the ships to come to trade, we call the warehouse. They called it a factory. It's a term from India. And so just where you put everything in was a factory. So the British took that term back. That's where you put all the machines. So it just, it just essentially is a warehouse for machines. And if you look at it that way, I guess it kind of makes sense. So 
The first power was what kind of power, not steam, what was it? Water power, rivers, streams, whatever. Let's get to the steam engine, James Watt. The video is going to talk talking about James Watt, but make a lot of Oh, sure, yeah, there's a lot of them. Their efforts were steam cars going back to that we would consider a car. They didn't work. Yeah, I'll show you why in a second. But they were just incredibly dangerous and foolish. So there's a man named Robert Newcomer who made an engine, something like this, to pump water out of a mine. As you dig down, you know, you dig, water comes in. Now, we live in Montana, so you have to dig down pretty far. But if you live someplace that, let me give you an example, a place that rains. So not here. Oh, here. Seattle. Hmm. Or Britain. You dig down, boom, there's water. And so there's a constant problem of pumping the water up. I'll give you an example of that. So in Montana, you dig down far enough, it's going to fill up with water. You drive into Butte from Helena. What's the first thing you see to the right when you get to Helena or when you get to Butte? Yeah, the big pit. And what's it full of? Yeah, all the water from the mines. Because the mines were filling with water because they dug down. They were pumping it out, pumping it out for years. And about 30 years ago, they quit pumping it up, and the water just flowed down. That's where it comes from. So you need pumps for mines. It's a big problem. Newman came with an engine, kind of like a steam engine. It would steam engine would pump, but it wasn't efficient. He had all kinds of problems. James Watt perfected it. Now, the first steam engine that was actually workable goes back to the Greeks, about 150 BC. But the problem was they never really used it for anything except for like a toy. You have to turn and spin, it was just steam, and then they put like, um, they put flags on it to spin, just things like that. They didn't use it for work, for, for a machine. But here is a steam engine, and it works like this. You need a fuel source to heat water right here. The water goes into a piston. I'm sorry, not the water. The steam, after you heat it up, the superheated, goes into steam. Steam goes into the piston. When steam comes in, it pushes the piston up. This rocks up, and use that mechanism to turn the wheel. Now, the problem is this. You put the steam in, how do you get the steam down? Or how do you get the piston down? If you just release the steam, it stays hot. The steam um, doesn't cool down fast enough, and it's really inefficient. So what they would do is they would release the steam and spray in a jet of cold water. That immediately cools it down, sucks out the steam, I mean, boom, the water comes out, the piston comes down, put steam in, goes back up, and that's the steam engine. So what do you need? Lots of fuel for heat and lots of water. So if you ever look about around Montana and you wonder why is there a roundup? It makes no sense that there's a Townsend. Why is there three forms? Why is there a Manhattan? Why is there a Big Timber? You know why? So when they, when they started making the first trains, this happened. I'm from Montana. You can see it in Britain, you see it in Europe. The first steam locomotives, every 15 miles, they had to get more water. So the train had to stop, get water. So when they stopped, they built a small station. What's going to foam around the station? Now, yeah, Townsend, Montana. Every place Townsend. Every 30 miles, you need fuel and water. And so if the train's not better, it's going to be every 30 miles. So that's why there's towns. And, that, and that's why they don't really make sense. And then when the train started dying and things started changing, if you go across eastern Montana, you see these towns like Terry. There used to be about 1,500 people when I was in high school, when I was about five. There's no one there. Why? Built up because of the train, and now they're slowly done. So that's 
So that is the issue about the constant need of steam and the constant need of fuel. And that's part of the reason why a steam power target. You need to haul a big thing of fuel. So that's a steam engine. And Watt perfected it, and it saved a significant amount of energy. And now you have power. You don't need to be by stream. It changes everything. The steam engine, what an amazing invention. Absolutely amazing invention. Here is the first steam engine patent in the United States. Now, the first ones are big and really dangerous. I forgot to tell you one more thing, too. I think you probably guessed where the danger is. This has got to be really pretty high quality iron. And then steel is much better. Steel is stronger, but there's no real process to make steel. But you put that steam in there, it's under a tremendous amount of pressure. And if there's any weakness in this, you keep pump, pumping steam in there. That piston is going up and down, up and down. What might happen? They're really dangerous. There's going to be some monumental explosions on steam because of steam engines. So there's a steamboat coming back from New Orleans during, right up to the Civil War. And it was a steamboat. And it was a combination of hospital ship and also just a bunch of men on trying to get home. You know, this. after the war, after the Civil War. Steam engine exploded south of St. Louis and 2,500 people died. And that was not unusual. There were a number of just shockingly horrible steam engine explo or steamboat explosions across England in the early 20th century or early 19th century. Doesn't mean it's not an incredibly effective engine, but it, it is dangerous. So they did try to make a little car with this, but you can imagine the problem with that. You got the red hot car right behind it. That yeah, didn't work very well. A steam engine worked better. And so with that, oh, I, I did put the car. I couldn't remember what it was. That's the car. So I was in this little museum in Yorkshire. We saw that. I can't even show that. And they tried to rivet it on there. And you would drive this thing with a red hot um, piston going behind you. Kind of cool in a very scary way. So with that, Britain had the key raw material. Okay, they tried wood at first, but they're already short of wood. We talked about that before. What's the raw material that Britain had? In fact, it was an island of what? Coal. That's why the making of coal, superheating it for the impurities out. Remember from the video they called it oak? It burns more efficient, and therefore your steam engine will go better, and now production will not be tied to water. Is that? And so, this is just coal, and there'll be mines all over. And Montana has a significant amount of coal. Now, it's, it, it burns very dirty and, and et cetera, and these towns that have these steam engines will literally be so black with soot, you won't see five feet in front of you. And coal has all kinds of other pollutants and mercury that'll get in the air, you know, they just didn't think about it at that time. And the things we have to deal with now. But these were the biggest areas of population. Here's where the coal is. Look where the population was. As everybody moved to the factories or had or had no choice, but they live in these towns like Manchester or Birmingham because of the factories or Liverpool. And it's a direct line. Once you have increased coal production and steam engine, you need to make better steel. And that led to the next big innovation in mines and forging of iron and eventually steel. Oops. And so, coal had more mobility than wood. Iron is stronger than wood. And so these are the innovations that would eventually lead to better ironworks and steel. Puddling. Puddling was what they would do as a process to make steel. Incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. but we were just talking about that yesterday. Pig iron was another method. Iron goes back, and remember we talked about this if you're here first semester, going back to the Hittites. How many remember the Hittites? You in here, yeah, I remember the Hittites. They first were making iron back 3000 BC or 1500 BC. But pig, pig iron 
is superheating the iron. So you need coal and the impurifications come out and you got stronger iron. And when they would make it, it would bubble and gurgle like a snorting pig. Pig iron, get it? And hot blast. Hot blast would superheat this. Eventually, we would call this a blast furnace. Have you heard of that term before? It comes with a hot blast. Where they would do these in these kilns, and they would use tile on the inside that would radiate the heat down, and they get up over 1,000 degrees. If you drive out, um, keep going, I'm prospecting, go out of town, go to the, see my directions right, to the north, there are a bunch of these old blast furnaces out there. There's a bunch of them. Just pause. Yeah, just if you keep going past the library. What's that? Yeah, Grizzly Gulch. In fact, both ways. I mean, the road B. Uh, Grizzly Gulch, I think there are five blast furnaces. Yeah, it, it's it, but it's not for the same thing they were making here, but the same exact design. And then the Bessemer process in 1856 would do steel. And this would change the world. It was a process to take what they were doing for pig iron and taking the steel production. And nothing would ever be the same. And so Bessemer process, but this will have to get for steel. After this, steel became the measure of a country's power. How much steel you can make. That means the country has to be wealthy enough to purchase this new process and eventually get better called a glass furnace and make steel by the end of the decade or by the end of the century. Steel production meant technological power, industrial power, wealth. And whoever started first had a big advantage. This started in Britain, but since Britain was relatively complacent because of their great wealth starting the Industrial Revolution, the United States actually took off with the best of process after the Civil War. And by the end of the century, the United States would produce more steel than the rest of the world to find. Now, by 1914, Germany was catching. Germany was catching. The only problem is there'd be a little war. Let me rephrase that. There'd be Armageddon. And Germany would destroy their industrial production. A lot of it. And then there'd be another one. And so that would give the United States an advantage on that. So I just want to give you an idea of how fast the production went. It's, not, it's kind of shocking just for Britain. But look at the number of workers. And the thing about it is, is that you can't do a coal mine on your own. And now they're reliant forever on this job. Whoever has the mine and the machines, the capital. But look at the tons of iron. It's a totally different world. Once you had iron, your ships are stronger, you can ship more, everything changed. And that's gonna to lead to the next big thing, the transportation revolution. So if we have fuel, and now we have factories that could produce it. And so now you have factories starting up around these coal mines, you gotta still gotta get the goods to market. And so we talked a little about, about the transportation revolution, but the big thing is over the next, it's going to be about a 50 year process from about 1780 to 1830 in Britain, 1810 to about 1860 in the US, 1830, 1880 in Germany. Shipping prices would drop by 50% overall. And if shipping prices drop that much, remember we talked about this in the video. If the price to ship something drops by 50%, what can shippers? do to the price they sell, they sell their goods. They can lower it and still make money. Undercutting competitors and increasing their market. More people can afford to buy this stuff. And so the first one, the canals, and the canals begin to tie the market. The video did a great job of this. <laughs> this is the canal, canal in France. This is the building of Locke in Britain. Canals are really expensive. Oh, how do they move those? What are we doing back here? How do they move these canals? How do they move the boats on the canal? Hmm? Well, locks are allow you to go up and down hills. So they built the lock, they said allowed you to, they would open this door and let the water out and you go down to a lower level. 
The locks are really cool. They'd be flat on the side. Yeah, have mules or horses or whatever pulling. And so you don't need the once it's good, you don't have to go fast. And so you just have something next to it to pull it. And therefore, you don't need to take up the room with an engine. You just pull it along. They might throw a sail on there and just give a little bit of wind power if the wind's going with you. If not, whatever, you just pull it. That's why if you go along these canals, they're great for walking. They're great for hiking. I, I went on a, a canal walk, you know, about, I don't know, 15 miles or something in Britain. It was just so nice going through the countryside. But I'll tell you the best place in the world. Huh? It's a short 15 miles. <laughs> no, actually, uh, you, I'll got to the whole story. So we got up in the morning, all we have is a day path. They, huh? Oh, I, I usually walk between 20 and 30 miles an hour. <laughs> this is what happened. Now, I'll tell you why it wasn't that what It really wasn't that bad. In the morning, it was, a van took you to this place. It was really flat, a couple little gradual places to walk up the lot. And they met us at a spot for a snack, and we had to sit and relax, and they gave us water. And that's another place. Yeah, it was a tour, but we walked. It, and then we drove us back to the hotel and we're done, and it was, it was a lot of fun. 15 miles is not that far over about 10 hours. You guys, have, all right, that, that's going to be your final project. We're going to drop, well, I'm going to get a bus and drop you out sometime in the countryside. And the first person back before the period ends passes. Everyone else back to first grade. I'm just telling you the rules. No. It, England, it was maybe 50. Yeah. Oh, no, I wouldn't do it. I, I could, I'd go further. So canals. Oh, one more thing I'll tell you. If you go to Washington, D.C., there's a canal there. That, it's called the CNO Canal, and it goes into the Appalachian Mountains. And it's amazing. I walked about three miles. It's better now. You, you know, it goes about my feet. But you walk into the mountains. It's beautiful. You not have you been there? It's wow. Is it cool? So you go through the mountains and like along the Potomac and the Shenandoah River and wow. If you get a chance, just I don't know people. They have the same thing. They they you walk and then they'll take you to like a, a bed and breakfast to sleep and then and or just get a backpack and go. When, when my wife and I did it, we were walking. We just we walked about three miles from Harpers Ferry, and we met with these people and walked with them. They were walking from Maine to Florida. It's part of the trail that goes all the way down the Appalachians. So we're not we're not going to do the same ground here. Let's jump right to, and then one more development with canals would be the steamship. Once you can take the steam engine and put it on a ship, this would revolutionize transportation. As you can imagine, no longer you'd be tied to the winds. No longer will you uh, uh, be restricted in weight because you have to go by sail. Ships could be bigger. They could be stronger. Here's the biggie. They got uh, iron and steel hulls. If you have an iron hull, it can last longer. It can hold more. It can last storm. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Not let's put it, you know, not the fact they were always exploding, but it was what was the percent? I don't know the exact percent. But let's put it this way, it was high enough that, that you knew about it other than eh, it's I'm going a lot faster, but it could blow up. Yeah. Um, they use steam ships for uh, workers. Oh yeah. And so almost immediately they started using them for, especially the fast, um, the faster ships like frigates or cruisers. And then eventually the um, the British would start taking these for battleships. Because the big thing about that is once you have a steamboat like this, you can get, instead of having a bunch of relatively small cannon because of the weight, you can have a few much bigger cannon. And once you have that, it gives you a huge advantage. In fair enough, a few huge cannons and a bunch of small ones, which naval battle. Especially when gunpowder is coming and better weapons. 
But they like know it's in these books. Just gotta know it. Like they're there for time. Like yeah, jump off. At first they didn't know. But that's why they had to. It's, it's like one of those innovations. They had to come up with it, something with pressure gauges. And they had to develop it. So if the pressure got too high, they could change it. And so as they did that, they got safe. But it's one of those things, you, you know, we just take for granted, but you know, so many things that are safety measures were innovations because there was a danger that solved some of the problem. And so really dangerous 1840, 1850 when they first started. Every year it got less dangerous. Or you think about building a steamboat, you want to know. Yeah. Yeah, I so. And then the steam locomotive. And that would revolutionize transport. Now, Railroads are about three times more expensive than water. Railroads are about three times more expensive than water. Transportation. I mean, it's a boat. I mean, think about a boat, how much you could put in a boat. So if you've ever seen one of the super container ships now that can hold 1,000 tons, they're, they're, they're the size of, of over three football fields. Right. They're just huge. Why? Because the water is buoyant and hold that. Railroad, you can't do that on land. But railroad, you can get more places. You don't have to dig a canal. Building a railroad, is, although difficult, you're not stuck to only flat land or making very expensive uh, locks. And so it gives you a lot of advantages. And I should add, even today, railroads are anywhere from one-tenth to one-fifteenth the price of road transportation now by trucks. Significantly cheaper by rail. We pay a premium in the United States for food because everything's shipped by, by truck. And so, for example, I know this just because my sister-in-law was here this summer from Berlin, and she couldn't get over how high the prices were for food in the United States. It just kind of blew her away because so much of it's transported by rail there, and it's not, not near as much as in the United States anymore. So it really is a lot cheaper. So George Stevenson would make the first one. And this baby would whiz along at about, you know, 12, 50 miles an hour and run out of fuel in about five months. But still, how fast was everything moving before the train? Yeah. I like, I like how they said it in, in day universe change. Did you catch that? Where you move between three miles an hour or stop. Because you don't move. Everything moved at this, and then all of a sudden, in 20 miles an hour, the first trains were like a carnival run. They'd all get on, Roar, wave, and ride on them. But the, so the first, they literally sold them as a ride. But you can see what's coming. That would be the first steam engine with the fuel. It was incredibly efficient, 1825. And then there's the rocket. The first workable steam engine, that's at the Train Museum in York, England. And what's this for right here? Yeah, the water for the steam. And then they put the wood here. They use wood at first, but wood is, doesn't burn near as hot as coal. And so I should have, by the end of the century, they start using oil. Makes sense. Oil burns at a higher temperature. And I have no idea who this guy was. Yes, it was a picture of me standing like an idiot in front of the very same train. I decided not to show you that one. But I took the picture and I thought, oh, I got, I tried to get a picture of just the train. You know, you do that, and, you know, like I'm just going to get the train so I can show it. And some guy was standing there. And then I realized, well, that's not a bad thing to get an idea of the size of the train. You're trying to figure out. And he, he was seven foot two. That guy was seven foot two. I asked him. I thought he was sit, I thought he was standing on it. I mean, <laughs> he was just normal. Now, does anybody recognize these right here? They're like stagecoaches. Like, uh, they're like, um, they pull by horse. They just took those coaches that were pulled by horses and put them on trains. And in fact, well into the 20th century, the passengers would get out on the side of the train. They just opened the door from the booth and walk right out the side of the train. And so they had to have warnings all over saying, do not open when train is moving. They would open right up on the side. These are that's a door right there. So like they just come through the stop. Yeah, open the door. 
And then eventually, by the 20th century, they have a lock. And that's one the conductor would do. It's unlock all the doors. Because so gay moves would do that. I bet one of you might be one of those people. I'm going to roll right on. Ah, wave. Yeah, we just saw two right there. Now, that's a really dumb thing to do. Not only because I figured that out myself, but let me tell you one very good reason. What is the long train tracks? The first telegraph lines. Uh, so there's a pole. And so go, ah, bang, there's the pole. Did people do that? Yes. yes. You want one more story? Yes. So when I was one of the, you know, the trips, like I said, my wife and I are very frugal, so we can take trips. My wife and I were taking a, a night train, actually with, with her sister and her husband, from Prague to Krakow, Poland. And great, both places, amazing. Prague, I'll tell you more stories about Prague. I've never seen a place, a few places more beautiful, you know, I've never seen a place with more women with broken ankles. But anyways, we're driving along and should I tell you that story? There's cobblestones all over, and the cobblestones are starting to wear away, so there's big cracks in between them. Uh, but women in Prague all wear high heels. I mean, that is what they do. And we're not talking about it. We're talking about it. Okay, that's high yeah. for But really high, high heels. So think about this. Thing snapping. And so the edge of that high heel hits that hole between the rock, uh, between the, between the cobblestones, and what happens? Huh? I don't know. Yeah. Let me tell you real quick, though. The train is going, and we're sitting at the conductor, and the conductor's telling us about this, and he goes, and he's, Jack, but they spoke very good English, because he knew we we're all English speakers. He said, don't stick your head out the window. But OK, he goes, no, don't stick your head out the window. Two weeks ago, some dumb Brit stuck their head out the window even though they're not British tourists, they're infamous for being stupid. Stuck their head out the window like this, was waving, and hit the pole. What do you think happened to him? The train was going 90 miles an hour. The train was going 90 miles an hour. Okay, now that makes sense. So, yeah, I think, I don't know if he, I don't think he had time to say ouch. By the way, do you know about British tourists? Yeah, they're infamous. British tourists for being really just very polite, nice, never brawl, brawling. I, that, that what you heard the first time. Oh, oh good. It, well, this is the, it's like, oh, there's a group of people from Britain here. Yay. Oh, it's a bunch of young men from Britain. Yes, that's so much fun. Yeah. Nothing will be broken, including bones soon. Usually it's them, though. They just do really dumb things. I saw a group at a bachelor party in Amsterdam. And it was. So it's much more. They didn't drink shots, but I just saw this group of like gay idiots. Amsterdam's really cool and the great museums, but Amsterdam's really cool. The miscellaneous category is always already full. <laughs> Are we going to the library? We're going to start here and close the reading. Yes, I'm going with the other thing. Oh, that's all. That's that one. <laughs> just kill John or just the other thing? The way the Amazon? Yeah. <laughs> 
We made the mistake when we were Oh, whatever. Yeah, oh, that, that, that's awesome. What's popping? Oh, you ready to skip day yet? Yeah, Monday. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You ready? Yeah. Do you need more to be done? I may not be. Okay. <laughs> Oh my god, it's a Is that what you were looking for? Oh, Lord, yes. I love him. Are you going to explain anything? Or are you just going to keep freezing my. Great land serpents. <laughs> it's Thomas. Hey, ducks. No. It's Thomas. The free market. <laughs> Self-interest. Competition. Arrow leads to quality and controls prices. Supply and demand oh, errors. Like, 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 Division of labor. Slash is productivity. Inequality arrow. Monopoly. Smith arrow. Government must drag Capitalism. I actually. What are you doing? I'm teaching. Oh, no, you gotta quit because we gotta do something we gotta do. Oh, yeah. Hey, stop. 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 Prepare. I just want to know that I don't give it. Don't ever 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 I did not have far as your butt. I've not seen a lot of years. I all right, everybody, give me a sec. What are you? Okay. This is Friday. I agree. Yeah, but yes. You should have just gone. I love this song. Band, I, I, I like it. I don't think I'm going to Hey, you got a message. Pretty good. Uh, good All right.
Yeah, I like Google Code. All right. So, couple announcements. First thing is first. First thing is first. Th hey, what? This is due on a. Hey, this is due on Wednesday. So it was due two days ago, and I'm very disappointed in all of it. <laughs> so, so on Wednesday we start the presentations. We are going to do. I'm trying to decide. I'm going to show you something on Dillinger, probably the most famous gangster. And gives me a chance to watch the American experience on Dillinger that you all love, right? Yes. Absolutely. There you go. You're going to go so far. Yes, sir. And. Unless you're in Britain. Oh, we're not class. We're not going to be. You guys are going to be here on Tuesday. No. Juniors. Senior second. No, no. <laughs> I'll be here. Monday's senior have their parents call them out of school day? Yeah. yeah. Oh, gosh, I love that. You know, okay. nothing more honorable and brave than that. I'm going to take it a stand. Okay. <laughs> but back to this. So, Wednesday they're due. And one more thing. So, the Vigilante Parade reg registration is right now. And if you are on a float, so you work on a float, or if you're in the band or marching, whatever it might be, and you can get a picture of yourself doing it, you will get extra credit in this class. So you will do it. But like I said before, you will not get extra credit. You will not get extra credit in Walter Cathedral. We talked about this, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's called the show. That's if you're in AZ US history and the vigilante flow is this. Well, then you work. There's a work day on Thursday, so you work on it and they try to figure out a way to get on it after the. You just, I ran it. You ran it, you got on All right. So, everybody, grab all your stuff, be quiet in the hallway. We'll talk about it. So I have no trailer or time. I'm not walking the way. That's half the fun. I know, I know. In my day, we wasn't like that. Everybody was polite.